Can you guys hear us in the back? Amazing. All right, everyone. Um, I'm Josh Frank, co-founder and CEO of The Thai. Uh, we're going to be talking about market infrastructure today. So why don't we start and just go down the line. Can you know, everyone here give us a little bit of a background about yourself, your firm? Yeah, hi, everybody. I'm James Smith. I'm one of the co-founders of Elliptic. Um, we set up Elliptic in 2013, so we're pretty early in the space. Uh, we are uh, one of the leading providers of uh, compliance tools. So we work with big exchanges, um, banks, funds, traders, uh, governments to help them analyze uh, transactions for compliance purposes. And we also uh, are now uh, working in the data and analytics space. So we provide a lot of um, on-chain information about crypto assets to funds and other people who are trading crypto. Hi, everyone. My name is Sophia Schluger. I'm the managing director for Amber Group in Europe. We are a leading digital asset platform offering institutional and retail clients the ability to access uh, liquidity, earn yields, and mitigate risk in uh, digital assets. Uh, we just raised our Series B plus, uh, $200 million at a $3 billion valuation. Uh, we have traded about $1 trillion notionally of crypto since inception, um, and we currently have $5 billion in AUM or trading capital, which we hope to, to double by the end of the year. So we are a large uh, liquidity provider in the market, uh, OTC desk, market maker, and we have a lot of other services that we offer, such as asset management, mining, um, uh, we do principal investments, etc. Thanks for being here. Hi, my name is Chris Tara. I run the international business for Fidelity Digital Assets. Uh, Fidelity Digital Assets is part of the Fidelity Investment Group, which is an uh, asset manager with $12 trillion under administration. Um, at Fidelity Digital Assets, we provide, um, we have two pillars to our business. One is prime services, so custody, trade, execution, collateral agency. The second part of our business is asset management. So we have a, a suite of uh, exchange traded products trading around the world and we're in the process of developing more, more passive and active products uh, to be launched over the coming months. And my name is Alistair McAlpine. I work at NASDAQ. Uh, I represent the commercial technology arm for NASDAQ, which is market technology. So we develop and deploy technology solutions to around 2,300 financial institutions. And I specifically work on what we call the market infrastructure business. So tr supporting traditional exchanges, clearing houses, uh, we provide regulatory solutions in terms of market surveillance, and um, essentially we are you know, very much a technology-driven company, and that's our strategy. So. And so why don't we start here with Alistair and go down the list. Uh, what are the most important developments that we have seen in terms of institutional uh, market infrastructure and crypto, and what critical pieces do you think are still missing? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the fundamentals of a sound marketplace still rely on some very key ingredients. You need robust technology, it needs to be scalable, it needs to be resilient, and it needs to be able to allow you to operate that with integrity. So essentially, you know, we see no difference between what you would call a traditional marketplace and a crypto marketplace in, in, in that perspective. And <clears throat> so I, what I do find is interesting in, as the, the growth of crypto and digital assets expands, there's, going to, there's a lot more opportunities out there in terms of how the two industries can, can interconnect. But at its base, we still believe that you need to have a solid, solid, robust, scalable platform in order to give your market participants comfort that the trading and that the trades that they do are, are going to be reliable, but also that you have the tools in place to make sure that any kind of actors that are, that are in, the, in the marketplace can be monitored and to ensure that you have an integrity in the market. Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, you know, I think if we look back five years ago, so it would be in Q117, I mean, the state of the crypto asset market infrastructure was still really very basic. I mean, we had, you know, a lot of different exchanges, but in periods of high market stress, you could have price discrepancies between those exchanges of anywhere between 5 and 10%. Um, you know, there was no institutional, really institutional custodians, like Fidelity had not announced the launch of its business, which, which happened in October 2018. And so there, whilst there was market access, it was really very primitive at that point in time. I think what we've seen since um, is a massive development in terms of infrastructure. So we now, I think, have solved institutional custody, and Fidelity has been part of that journey. Um, you know, the quality of, um, you know, exchanges and, you know, liquidity venues has definitely developed a lot. You know, we've seen from, on one of the previous panels, we heard from Jenna, from LMAX, you know, that was, 
um, uh, an exchange that has come out of nowhere and has been you know, catering exclusively for institutions and is a very meaningful development. So I think there's, you know, and then we have like the development of, uh, the further development of a lot of the blockchain analysis tools like Elliptic and so on and so forth. So I think it has been, um, it has been a very, very rapid pace of development. I think, and that is borne out um, in the institutional investor study that, that Fidelity Digital Assets publishes. And so what we've seen over the last couple of years, and we've now run this study for three years, so we're starting to see some short-term trend data. The concerns that investors have around um, infrastructure, so custody, execution, liquidity, all of those things are declining in relevance when we ask them what is the single largest obstacle to making an allocation or an investment. Um, you know, we do see certain areas that, that continue to be issues such as volatility, but the infrastructure piece is definitely declining. So from our side, we are a crypto native company. We built our entire tech stack in house. And I think having that infrastructure um, is really a competitive advantage. Um, obviously because it means that we're very modular, that companies can integrate with us as they see fit in kind of a plug and play uh, scenario, so sort of like crypto as a service. Um, and so, you know, I think we, we take a lot of pride in, in what we've built, um, and as a result of that, you know, we're able to offer, uh, you know, really great connectivity. We're able to connect. We've worked uh, and traded with, you know, DeFi, Web3, games, oracles. Um, you know, I think the way that we've built our infrastructure um, is, is, is what has been able to facilitate the amount of you know, trading that we're able to, to have. Uh, just for context, we trade about 5% of the daily volume of crypto, so between three and five billion a day in spot and derivatives in the major pairs. And I think being crypto native is, is definitely, uh, you know, it's is been a benefit for us and I think will continue to be so in the future. Um, look, uh, I think when we set up the company in 2013, there was no market infrastructure. Um, and, and that was really a, one of the premises for us is, of setting it up is if this is going to be real, then it needs to be a, a market with the infrastructure that people are used to. Um, we took our first meeting in an abandoned warehouse somewhere in East London uh, with a, a bunch of anarchists. And, and so things have certainly changed a lot in that time. Um, I think, as, as Chris said, like a lot of the focus in the early years has been around, uh, around three pieces, around uh, secure custody, um, around exchange and around compliance, because those are really the three obstacles that anyone needed to get past in order to come and participate in the space. And, and those are all now at a reasonably mature level. It's, certainly they can go further, but um, I, I think now we're starting to see the next layer of services um, start to get traction, but they, uh, there's certainly gaps if you're thinking about it coming from a, a TradFi perspective. So the, the maturity of things like um, of data and analytics, of uh, order routing, of indexes, um, and, and frankly, like joining all the pieces together, it, exchanges all look a little different from each other, and um, you know, coming and figuring out how you can get best execution and so on is, is still pretty uh, immature. So that means, to some people, that, that's a risk, perhaps. To others, I think that's a real opportunity, and, uh, and the people who are getting stuck in are really taking advantage of those um, areas of nascency that are yet to mature. And so this is actually a great follow-up question. I know a few of you guys may have alluded to this, um, you know, but James, obviously you, you, you are crypto native, right? You've been in a space for 2013. I think you epitomize that at this point. Um, do, are there solutions in this space which require crypto native solutions? You know, do we need to reinvent the wheel here? You know, what kind of is uniquely crypto? Um, I think the, uh, so two parts to that. So, the way I'll, I'll talk from the perspective of what we do of, uh, of on-chain analytics, um, yeah, the way we approach it is very crypto-native because the data visibility in crypto is very different to in TradFi. Uh, every transaction is recorded on a public blockchain, uh, and so there's a lot of interesting insight you can pull out of that. Um, so when you try to answer a question like, uh, you know, like the basic question in anti-money laundering, what's the source of funds? Um, you've got a very different data set to work from than you would if you were at a bank and all you've got is your counterparty. Um, so certainly the approach to it is crypto native in our world. Uh, but the, um, the interface to the customer has to look like they would expect from anywhere else. You know, when, when the next bank comes to us and asks us to set them up with a compliance solution or with data analytics solution, it needs to fit into their existing model. And so I, I don't think the, like the paradigm has to be different, but some of the implementation has to certainly be crypto-native. Um, 
Well, I guess I would say, you know, in the market, like the lack of clearing and the fact that the markets are, fr are so fragmented, it means that that capital efficiency is very poor, and so cross-margining is really key. And so, you know, for example, you know, the benefit of you know working with Amber Group is that obviously, you know, our clients can buy crypto, um, they can park that crypto and earn yield, and then they can also, you know, use that to um, trade on margin. So I think again, it just has to do with how nimble we can be because of our infrastructure and, and what we offer. Yeah, I would say, you know, certainly, you know, to answer the question, you know, do certain things have to be different? I think certain things have to be different. Like custody fundamentally looks very, very different for crypto assets as it does for traditional financial securities. Um, you know, that said, I think we're getting to the point now where we're starting to see the disaggregation of certain functions. So historically, we've seen exchanges that also act as custodians. You know, we have the launch of venues such as TPI cap, which should, should be live in market in the next, in the next say, two to three months, um, you know, they were looking to implement a more familiar model for them. TPI Cap's the largest inter-dealer broker in the world, you know, but they, their expertise is matching liquidity, is in custodying, you know, assets, and therefore they're working with um, uh, a series of third parties, ourselves included, to support that venue from a custody and, and um, settlement infrastructure perspective. So I think that, you know, historically people have looked at crypto as just this, you know, everything has to be very different. But like matching engines and front ends, these are things that are just ubiquitous across, you know, all asset classes. And so really it's just about identifying what is different and what is not. Yeah, and I think what I would add is what I see, because typically we, we deal with traditional bricks and mortar exchanges and we're very experienced in building these, these kind of systems. I think what we're seeing now, people talk about institutions are coming. I think it's slightly different. I think they're already here, just unevenly distributed, because what, <clears throat> what the institutions are doing now is having to find ways to create new models which still respect the existing regulations and the, 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 the frameworks in place, but somehow adapt to the new reality, which is how do we integrate all of these new concepts like staking and lending? And, and that's basically liquidity. So you're either in it or you're out. And that's the interesting part of the conversations that I have with our clients because they come to us primarily because they would like to have a, an industry-grade matching engine, a, a recognized surveillance solution that the regulator uses, but they also have to figure out themselves how do we blend this, this hybrid infrastructure so that we can think about things like custody, how do we think about things like alternative market data. And so <clears throat> I think the institutions are quite advanced, it's just not that evident just yet in terms of coming up with these additional market models which allow people to trade following traditional norms but with with a view to capture the, these, these new asset classes. So one thing you just alluded to are the institutions are coming and we've, we've heard that for a long time but institutions is kind of has a different meeting in crypto than it mm. does in traditional you know capital markets right so what do we mean by the institutions are coming and I think Chris this would be great to start with you given your your, your role at Fidelity for the last you know three years within crypto but what types of institutions are here, and how has that progressed? How has that changed over time? Yeah, sure. So I would say three years ago. So institutions, you're right. In crypto, I think that means non-retail. Like yes. in in a, in, a, in capital markets, yes. it means something like it means real money. It means something very different. Yes. Uh, but if we're talking about non-retail, what are the, you know, I would say let's say three to four years ago, before the pandemic hit, um, it was really kind of crypto natives and then some niche players in the space. I think then. You know, the pandemic and the sort of central bank monetary response and then the following fiscal response that we saw to that really sort of elevated Bitcoin as this sort of macro um, uh, monetary commodity that people took a, a real interest in just given the macro environment that we were, that we were faced with. Um, I think, you know, and that, re that really brought then a sort of wave of early movers in terms of hedge funds. But I would still say at that point in time, the in you were seeing institutions come into the space where the the investment decision was being made relatively close to the principal. So either like ultra high net worths, family offices, um, you know, hedge funds that had a small number of LPs, you know, are able to move more quickly or had an exceptional track record such as Paul Tudor Jones and just has that ability to be able to say this is what we're doing just because of the the the, the background and the and the and the kudos that he has. I think now what we're seeing you know, the last three to six months, I would say, has, has shifted yet again. And I think part of that is this rebrand that crypto went through. You know, people are talking less about crypto. People are talking about Web3, the metaverse, creative economies. It's almost like the, 
investment thesis around these assets has finally been articulated in a way that a lot of traditional investors understand. And you know, just anecdotally, you know, last year we would see, you know, the market trade is sixty thousand dollars. People are kind of the phones ringing off the hook. People want to get access to our products and services as quickly as possible. Price trades off, maybe not you know two to three percent, but price trades off thirty percent. Phone stops ringing. People stop answering your emails, <laughs> and it was just you know it was a very sort of uh, price driven phenomenon. I'd say what we're seeing now is as a result of this uh, rebrand that we've gone through, as a result of this sort of um, uh, more clearly defined investment thesis, we're seeing a lot more consistency and interest, but also the types of institution that are approaching us is just vastly different. A lot more of the kind of uh, what I would call real money, so the sovereign wealth, the pension funds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, it, it is definitely, from our perspective, gone through somewhat of a journey. Why don't we go to Alistair next? Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. I think it's been <clears throat> quite a big transformation. Like I said, from our perspective, you know, we are an institution. We provide technology for these digital asset providers. So we, you know, I'm, I don't mind it being, being labeled as TradFi because traditional means reliable, regulatory driven. <clears throat> and, you know, everyone knows what we do. But obviously, we, we're embracing new tech in terms of the cloud. And obviously, we, with our 140 plus market technology customers around the world, we get a lot of insight and uh, drive in terms of what people want to do. So we're also seeing these conversations evolve. Yeah, so um, at Amber Group, you know, we service over 1,500 institutional clients globally, and that's growing very quickly. Uh, we started actually servicing institutional clients and then brought in a retail offering a, a few years later. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, we service hedge funds, high frequency trading desks, family offices, high net worths, um, as well as the retail market. And we're onboarding two to three times as many institutions now as we were, um, you know, this time last year. And I think if you look at the data, you see that uh, the market has a lot of institutional support. And we've just had our 40 millionth uh, unique Bitcoin wallet. Um, I think something around like 1 million in Bitcoin is held by institutions or about 5% of the existing supply. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's very interesting to see some of the more traditional conservative institutional clients, the like of pension funds, endowments taking a look. I think a lot of the institutional clients perhaps are looking at more synthetic exposure to the marketplace, but I think over time that will uh, absolutely change. Um, obviously, the, the, the majors, Bitcoin and Ethereum, are, are the first assets that, that people really look at. And I think uh, in terms of investment strategies, people are going above and beyond sort of the, the carry trade in crypto. Um, to looking at other ways in which to get exposure. I mean, at Amber Group, we are investing very heavily. We have a dedicated team um, uh, looking at the metaverse. We're deploying you know, tools and applications and capabilities in that respect because we believe that um, crypto trading and digital assets is just one part of a larger continuum of DeFi, DeFi staking, NFTs, and the metaverse. And so what we've really built is uh, you know, a tech-centric platform for institutional clients to come and get exposure, digital assets, to use leverage, hedge, use margin, and more sophisticated tools like perps and derivatives and futures um, to get exposure to the market and obviously be the one-stop shop for them to have exposure and to be able to stake and to participate in the metaverse um, over the long term. So we take a very, let's say, long, uh, long view on where this market is going and we're looking ahead several years uh, beyond today. Yeah, and I think um, we've been saying, as you said, for five years, that institutions are coming, probably since Fidelity started, right? <laughs> and uh, we've updated the definition of what an institution is every year. Um, and I, I think it's just a sign of uh, the maturity. So going back to the, the first topic we discussed about what's there and what's missing, um, different businesses have different risk appetites and different requirements. And the more of that infrastructure uh, that becomes uh, mature and available, the wider the group of people that are going to be able to come into the market. I think we are still early. There is a long way to go for this space. And if you, we have this conference again in five years and 10 years, it's going to have changed so much. So I think the institutions are going to be coming for some time. And so on that note, you know, we have two crypto natives and, and true you know, TradFi companies, as we like to say in crypto. Who's going to win? Uh, is it going to be crypto native providers from a market infrastructure uh, point of view? Is it going to be you know tradfi providers? Is it going to be a combination? You know, kind of what are your what are your thoughts there? And maybe we can start. Actually, let me start with you, James, and just yeah, get sure. on the list. 
Yeah, um, I, I don't think it's going to be black and white, but uh, if I uh, you know, think back 20 years, you had all these internet companies, and no one talks about internet com companies anymore. Um, they're just the biggest companies in the world. And so I think that we're going to see some of the companies in crypto um, being the biggest financial services companies in the world. But I think we'll also see some of the uh, TradFi players figure out how to do crypto. Um, and, and so there, there will be a mix. But Coinbase isn't a $100 billion company or whatever it is um, because people think it's going to sit in the corner doing crypto. It's because they think that crypto is going to be everywhere and Coinbase will be offering financial services to the world. Yeah, so we're a market maker for banks, uh, tier one exchanges, and token issuers. And I guess I'd just give that as an example that you know we can facilitate market making from very you know sort of vanilla uh, distribution requirements up to the very high complex ones, whether it be lock drops, Dutch auctions, um, you know, uh, dual token structures, etc. So we have uh, many years of experience in the space facilitating very complex market making for mm. DeFi projects, et cetera. So again, as I alluded to earlier, I think what's, what's innovative and important about us is the way that we've been built, being uh, an owner of our tech stack, being able to be nimble uh, and having robust API connectivity, bank, bank uh, quality uh, infrastructure, battle-tested systems. You know, all of this really matters as we go deeper and deeper into uh, DeFi with all the innovation um, and development that's happening there. I think we are in a unique position uh, to, to be able to participate in the market given the infrastructure that we have in-house. Yeah, I, th I think it's I think it's definitely going to be a combination of the two. I mean, you know, I'm TradFi, but we, you know, we're we're a client of Elliptic as an example. Like, you know, we we definitely sort of partner in areas where um, where it makes sense. Um, you know, I think I think also as well the you know having you know the banks have been notably absent from this space, and I think the banks have been absent for a number of reasons, but predominantly because they don't have the regulatory air cover to operate. Um, but you know they they provide um, a lot of the connectivity and a lot of the services, financial services, and ultimately people just want to access. People just want to ease. If your if your prime broker is BNP Paribas, it would just be a lot more simple if you could access this marketplace through your existing prime broker. Um, the reality is is that doesn't really exist right now, and so people are having to um, you know instantiate new relationships. To operate because we have these. Whilst the market infrastructure within crypto has developed enormously over the last five years, it is separate and distinct from the legacy traditional infrastructure, and that's really what needs to develop over the next, you know, five years. And I think the incoming regulation, certainly in Europe with Mika, will definitely be a big proponent of that. And then I think I think we'll start to see. We have this sort of bifurcated system right now. We have crypto native and tradfi, and that's you know mm. that's how the question was framed, and that's how it is. You know, I mean, there are there are tradfi companies, and then there are crypto native. I think we will start to see that blend in both directions in fairness. Yeah, and I agree. I think it's I think it's a really exciting time. We've seen <clears throat> several waves of evolution of the industry. I mean, you know, companies that can leverage all of the DeFi access and with all the technology and the developers that they've got, they can move fast, they can they can explore new technologies without perhaps, you know, the, the, the some of the restrictions in place that traditionally companies would have. But I think the key thing is about how we position for it, because you know, speaking from a NASDAQ technology perspective, this is one of the reasons why we're aggressively embracing cloud. We announced last year our partnership with AWS, and the whole point of that is to, you know, number one, we're going to move one of our own markets to the cloud this year. So that's to test a very large options market in terms of scale. The second thing is about how we work together with this hybrid infrastructure so that at the same time as operating a low latency, reliable, resilient, and predictable exchange, because some of the problems with cloud prevent you from doing that. But we also want to be able to offer that extra connectivity through local zones and outposts. And, and I think that's part of our positioning in, in that space, because we want to work together with people exploring these new, new assets. We have a new matching engine, which is already designed to be cloud native, that can support any type of asset class and run 24-7. So we, <clears throat> we see where that's going. The cloud is part of the, the story. The digital assets is part of the story. But ultimately, we still need to think about how things are going to be regulated, because whichever way you look at it, once you start accessing the significantly larger sums of institutional money, the regulators will want to make sure that everything is done properly. And, and that's where the interesting, that's where it gets interesting, because you know, if you tokenize an asset, 
that's fine if it's an NFT or something that's not regulated, but if you're tokenizing something that looks like an asset, behaves like an asset, and is traded like a security that's re regulated on a normal exchange, well, guess what? The regulator's going to say that needs to be regulated. And that's where the interesting things happen. And so I, th I think another interesting and related question, I think, so Sophia, this would be great to start with you, is we've seen a mass exodus from traditional capital market firms into crypto. <laughs> Prime example, which is why we're starting with you here. Do we think that is going to continue, or, or do we think that trend will reverse? I mean, we've started to see finally a few people uh, start to join traditional hedge funds and traditional banks from crypto, and so we're slowly seeing a few people dribble in, but it, it feels like it's coming a lot faster the other way. Yeah, great question. So, I mean, one of the best pieces of professional advice I ever got early in my days uh, when I started at Goldman Sachs in New York was always stay with the growth. And I think unequivocally, you know, this is, this is where the growth and the innovation is. So, yeah, obviously we've seen a huge migration from TradFi into crypto. I think that will absolutely continue. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because at some point, you know, I think a lot of the TradFi institutions are, you know, going to be looking for crypto talent, right? Those who've worked in the space are really familiar with the different protocols and, and understand how the markets work. And so you might actually see at some point a migration back into TradFi as organizations beef up their digital asset teams. But it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Um, I know that a lot of the more conservative institutions, such as pension funds, who obviously perhaps don't have an investment mandate for digital assets, you know, they're really concerned about how they're going to be able to attract talent because you're seeing a lot of, um, you know, migration through, you know, uh, university recruitment, et cetera, away from, let's say, you know, the dot-coms, the tech companies into crypto. And so how, how to attract the right talent for the future is, is obviously, um, you know, a strategic, of a strategic importance to these organizations. I think going back to your previous question of who's going to win, I think any TradFi who is going to do well here is going to be uh, the type of person that is able to attract the crypto talent across. Um, I've, you know, in the last few years, known a few people go in that direction, but then just feel like they're stuck in this old school world where they're not ready for the change. And so, and, you know, they, someone who's bringing crypto talent across has to really be serious about building a crypto business. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, the talent question is always key. I mean, for us, it's about attracting people with the right systems that we build and the right workplace scenario that we have. And obviously, crypto, cryptocurrency startups and, and digital asset startups, they have this advantage, just like in the dot-com, that they can basically experiment and play sandbox with very tight, very smart teams. So the, 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 the resource profile is very heavily skewed now to people who are very strong in maths, who are very good with native understanding of technology, good with the remote work, cross cultural teams working multiple occasions at once. But I would say, I mean, you know, we're, we're all physically here, finally, after two years of not. And I think the last two years have also forced a lot of these big institutions to really focus, number one, on how do we, how do we work in a disjointed fashion and still maintain the systems, the cultures, the, the, the processes that, that keep us alive. But also it, it's made people realize that, you know, it's very important to hang on to your talent and give them that, the right working environment to do so. so I think it's, it's been an interesting couple of years. Yeah, I would, I would agree with everything that's been said. I think that it's, um, you know, we've clearly digital asset markets are experiencing enormous growth, which means that, you know, there is a high demand on bringing new talent into the space. Um, I think it's also just a super interesting area to work, so people are kind of attracted to that as well. You know, it kind of reminds me of the, you know, the early 2000s. So I traded commodities for, for nearly 20 years, and you know, in the early 2000s, we were seeing this explosion in, really in banks providing services in commodities, because historically, there were a couple of banks that were involved, but it was really a corporate hedging market, and there was only a few banks really servicing. That has now all changed over the subsequent 20 years. But during that period where we were seeing this phenomenal growth, the, it was really like, you know, the oil majors were just supplying the talent into the market. And, you know, in the fullness of time, once we hit a certain level of maturity, that started to reverse and stabilize. Like, we're going through that process at the minute. And I think that, you know, we will also see, coming back to the regulation piece, once we have sufficient regulation in place that gives banks air cover to provide services in the space, I think, you know, we're going to see the Goldman Sachs, the JP Morgan, the Barclays, the... The, 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 you know, the BAMLs, et cetera, set up desks, and that will require a, 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 you know, some of a reversal of that flow. But it's, you know, depending on as and when that comes, but clearly the, you know, attracting talent, retaining talent 
in operating an industry that is experiencing such high growth is definitely a challenge, I think, for everybody. And so I think a, another good question, actually, for you is education. Um, and how important is it for you to provide education to your client base, your prospective client base? How is that changing over time? And does education remain a barrier for adoption? Yeah, I think, I think it does. I think it's, um, you know, it's one of the key things we do. I mean, to honor, quite honestly, it's, you know, for, for the business development team, it's, it's, it's you know, a, a, the vast proportion of what they do is just education. Um, you know, being Fidelity, we obviously attract, you know, we have hooks into some of the largest traditional um, investment houses in the world. And, you know, they come to us because they're a brand that, you know, there's already a relationship there and that we're a brand that they trust. And so we provide a lot of these, um, you know, education type sessions. Well, that was embarrassing. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, I, th I think it's, you know, it seems to us like everybody is on this journey. It feels like people have finally woken up and really understand what this is all about. And you know, you might be at the very beginning of that journey and we ask, I mean, honestly, some of the questions that we get are fantastic, like how come you can't cut and paste a Bitcoin and stuff like this. But then it goes all the way through to you know, describe you know, the difference between you know, two layer ones and what do you think of the sort of relative merits of both and are we in a sort of multi-chain world or will this consolidate around a single chain, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's, you know, it feels now that the investment community is, is on, a, on, a, on a journey of learning. Everybody's just at different points. But I think it's, it's definitely incumbent on you know, everybody operating in the space to, you know, to help people into the space and understand, um, you know, understand the, 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 the nuances of this asset class. I'm going to go with you, Alistair. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think it's super interesting. The last couple of years has been transformational in terms of how people have got to understand finance. 20 years ago, finance was a slightly archaic black box. You needed to know someone to get a job there. You needed to have the experience. Um, in the last two years, you're basically seeing a whole bunch of digital natives who get all their information from TikTok, from, from, from Twitter, from YouTube channels. You know, you watch the crypto YouTube channels and they're doing, talking about technical analysis and MACD and you know, sentiment indicators. <clears throat> and these are very young people. And, and I think we're, we're, we have to be conscious of that because I think nowadays people are much more interested in finance and much more interested in the implications for what that brings. And then obviously DeFi then gives you that blending of the different worlds. So you do things like the metaverse and NFTs and so on. You, you, people are really starting to see the connection of how this could transform what we do. So we have to, you know, we, one, I think the, the younger generation is super smart and they understand exactly what a lot, a lot more uh, than, we, than we might imagine. And also, <clears throat> we need to nurture that talent and make sure that they, they have that playground to work. James, I think, yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so important to us that we have a dedicated team for education. We have an education hub. Um, <clears throat> you have to help people understand. Um, it, well, it's changed over the years. You had to help them understand what Bitcoin was seven years ago. Now it's helping them understand regulatory environment, helping them understand what data is available, um, how can they incorporate that data into the, their strategies, how can they make sure that they've got the right um, tools in place to protect themselves. So, yeah, uh, we, we see it as the very beginning of a long sales cycle, is, is helping people through that education journey, and then eventually we'll, we'll bring them on board. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, another um, point to, to mention is, you know, obviously everyone is still very concerned about ESG and societal issues that we all face in terms of climate change. So, you know, at Amber Group, we take a very proactive approach towards that. We actually have several initiatives in place. Uh, we actually adopted a whale named SALT through a whale and dolphin conservatory. Um, our flagship platform is called Whalefin, and so, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's related to to what we offer clients, but you know, we really believe that you know, crypto digital assets can be not only an asset class where you build your future wealth, but one in which you can also do good for the world. And I think as the market understands that we're you know, long gone or the rodeo days of Silk Road, uh, you know, that you can, you can do good and, and do well, um, you know, uh, keeping ESG in mind. You know, obviously, with all the innovation moving from a proof of work to proof of stake, um, you know, we're trying to reinitiate the conversation with, with a different emphasis. Um, and uh, we also have a partnership with Moss. We actually uh, bought $2 million worth of carbon credits to offset mining trade. So we're taking a very proactive approach on the ESG side. But yes, everyone, as, as you said, are in different places in their educational journey. Um, we, uh, you know, as much as we can, speak to clients, those who are still unsure of, you know, 
how digital assets can be valued, you know, what kind of flows we're seeing, you know, it's very important for us to have very open dialogues with our clients so they understand how important it is to be positioned in this asset class for the future. Um, so it's something we take very seriously. And actually for our, our sort of novice beginner crypto uh, investors, you know, we have a beginner's guide on our mobile app, on the web-based portal. And so as much as we can, we try to um, educate the market about the benefits of, of getting involved in digital asset investing. So let's do this super, super quick. We're running out of time here. We start with Alistair. I really care about m and I think it's super interesting. So what do we think about consolidation in the market infrastructure space in crypto? And how, what is your boldest prediction for the next five years? Let's keep these answers to 10 seconds. Well, we didn't prep that question. So that was a <laughs> but, uh, um, boldest prediction. I think that you, in the next five years, I think you'll see, you'll see Existing infrastructure providers um, will probably be looking to, to work together with the, the, the crypto natives a lot more. Um, but what I think we'll see is, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. Five years. I mean. Okay, I'll go. So I'll say the, the the West top twenty investment banks will provide services in physical physical digital assets. Um, I think we're going to obviously see tokenization of traditional assets. Um, I think on the DeFi space, we're going to see much better UX, UI. We're going to see more institutions participate in the DeFi market. Um, and in terms of consolidation, uh, you know, remains to be seen. There's obviously a lot of uh, exchanges out there, and uh, several of the large ones are on, a, on an M&A spree at the moment. So it'll be interesting to see how things shake out. But I think we're going to see a new um, a league of, let's say, crypto-native digital investment banks. And uh, that's my prediction for the future and for Amber Group. I think what, one to add to that is that I think we'll see someone from TradFi try to emulate what Coinbase and, and their peers are doing and go on a massive acquiring spree to try and build that portfolio of services. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you to the panelists. And thank you, Josh. <clears throat>